Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the 98th Mayor of Philadelphia and the David N. Dinkins Professor of Professional Practice in Urban and Public Affairs, Michael Nutter. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for being here. It is, uh, again, a tremendous honor uh, to be a part of this incredible uh, annual David N. Dinkins Leadership and Public Policy Forum. This, of course, is the 22nd annual uh, David N. Dinkins uh, Policy Forum, and it's a great, great honor, of course, to even be associated uh, with uh, this forum, uh, let alone uh, to continue to serve as the inaugural David N. Dinkins Professor of Practice uh, here at Columbia University, the School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, as always, uh, we have an exciting program uh, for you uh, tonight. I just wanted to welcome all of you, uh, friends, students, faculty, uh, and all of our guests. Uh, thank you uh, for being here this evening. This has been an incredible series over, again, uh, two decades. Uh, you'll recall, and you can see through your program, uh, the uh, vast array of wonderful speakers uh, that we've had, and uh, certainly tonight, uh, and she will be introduced in her own right, uh, but certainly uh, this evening, uh, this uh, keynote address uh, by uh, Maria Hinojosa, uh, of course, as a Barnard uh, graduate, uh, will in fact uh, not only be timely, uh, but important uh, given the nature of things, uh, many challenges going on, not only here in the United States of America, but our relationship uh, to many, many countries around the world, uh, and in particular, uh, on the southern border. And so uh, through uh, great, great planning, uh, Linda Hamilton uh, and the entire team, uh, but also every now and then you just get lucky uh, when you have an incredible speaker uh, that we have here this evening uh, and the timing of what is literally taking place in real time uh, in the United States and around the world. Uh, I look forward uh, to hearing from her. Uh, it's impossible to have a great school uh, with the legacy and history of the School of International and Public Affairs uh, without a great leader. Uh, and that leader, of course, is our dean, uh, Dean Marigiano, uh, who uh, provides fantastic leadership uh, here at SEPA, her focus uh, on uh, our students. This is the School of International and Public Affairs, uh, and uh, as well, her commitment uh, to diversity, uh, diversity of students, diversity of faculty, uh, but most importantly, the free expression of a diversity of ideas on a college campus is critically important. And so, without further ado, please welcome the Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University in the city of New York, Dean Merritt Jano. Thank you for those kind words, Mayor Nutter. You are an exceptional David Dinkins professor we are really grateful for your leadership, your contributions, your generosity uh, to our students uh, and our faculty and your chairmanship of the SEPA Diversity Committee. So welcome all to the 22nd Annual Dinkins Forum. This is one of the most highly anticipated uh, events of the academic year for our community and indeed for those who care about public policy and its ability to influence outcomes and improve lives. And every year we look forward reliably to the Dinkins Forum because the, we know that the topic that will be selected is one of great importance and interest and the speaker uniquely suited uh, to share his or her thoughts uh, on a matter of uh, contemporary significance. And we've brought extraordinary leaders now to our campus for more than two decades. The list is very long and the speakers uh, remarkable. Let me just mention a few. Um, and I think there are people here who've been to more than a few. Um, we've brought former US Attorney General Eric Holder, Congressman John Lewis, former Attorney General L Loretta Lynch, Senator Hillary Clinton, Mayor Bill de Blasio, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, Congressman Charles Rangel, Mayor Michael Bloomberg, Vice President Al Gore, I could go on. They've spoken on many critical issues, mass incarceration, civil rights, urban policy, gun control, voting rights, poverty and inequality, the future of cities, 
education, and much more. So continuing in this tradition, I feel that we are very fortunate to have this evening Maria Hinayosa as our keynote speaker. We think of her for her many roles as executive producer of Latino USA on National Public Radio, founder of Futuro Media Group, as one of America's leading journalists. And today she will speak about her life as an immigrant, as a journalist in our democracy. And following her remarks, we will have a panel on the topic of protecting immigrant children. You know, I think many of us believe the events this past year involving immigrant children at the U.S. Uh, border occur other places, but not in the United States. Uh, it's been disturbing to me, cruel, and really fundamentally not in sync with the values as a nation. So I think this will be an important conversation, and I look forward to the insights that it brings forth. But this forum would not exist without the vision and leadership of our great professor and public servant, Mayor David Dinkins, who created the Dinkins Forum not long after he arrived here in 1994. He has many achievements as mayor. He led the revitalization of Times Square. He reduced crime through his Safe Cities, Safe City Initiative, Safe Street, Safe City Initiative. Um, he ensured that the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament Championship remained in New York City, and, and that those are just a few examples. And in his honor and to recognize his legacy, the David N. Dinkins Professorship was established at SIPO. And a few years ago, New York City further recognized Mayor Dinkins by renaming the Center Street Hub of the New York City government as the David N. Dinkins Municipal Building. Columbia University Library has also established the David Dinkins Archive and Oral History Collection in 2015 to preserve his many papers and his legacy. We are very deeply appreciative of David Dinkins, his involvement as SEPA, and his incredible generosity to our students and collegiality with all of us. And before I invite him to the stage, I would like to take a moment to also recognize Linda Hamilton, whom I think all of you know has, has done a wonderful role at SEPA in supporting the mayor and has served as the principal organizer of this forum for the past five years. She's really done a fabulous job. And now it's my distinct honor to introduce to you the namesake of the forum, the Honorable David Dinkins. Please join me in welcoming him and thanking him for establishing this forum. Thanks very much. I'm delighted to see so many of you here. Uh, I have some remarks which I think I will not use. <laughs> if you if you forgive me, and if if the uh, author of these remarks will forgive me, I just want to say how pleased I am to see so many of you here. I look out and and see a lot of friends, and I'm so happy that you're here. Uh, as you know, we've been doing this for a few years now, and it's an awful lot of fun for me. I, I get the credit, but somebody else does the work. <laughs> and I, I hope that uh, you enjoy this as much as I do. Um, I can tell you that if were you to stand here and look out and see yourselves, You'd be very pleased. Uh, what a group. And th th to, to resist calling you by name and going one by one, which has been my want over the years, and, and staff always gives me hell for doing it, 
for a variety of reasons. One, you're going to leave out somebody. And two, uh, they really don't want to hear that. But I, I'm so pleased to see so many friends here. Uh, this is a, a special night for me. As I say, somebody else does the work and I get the credit. So uh, who follows me here? Somebody tell me. Who? Does Maria comes out now? Oh, well, hell, I've got a. If I'm introducing the keynote, then let me uh, revise all that I have said <laughs> and, and speak of her. She is a, a dear friend, and I'm so pleased at, uh, at her willingness to do this. Um, as you might imagine, she's in great demand, and uh, th this doesn't have to be at the top of her list, but that's what friends are for. So I'm so pleased that you're here. Um, Maria, where are you? Are you backstage? <laughs> I love that introduction. <laughs> this, is a, this is a very special lady. I kid you not. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're on. I appreciate that. Are you going to come to this way? I'll go, I'll go down here. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I love that. That's the I, seriously. I gotta say. And then the mayor said, "Maria, where are you?" <laughs> I mean, that's like New York, 100%. It doesn't get any better than that. I mean, to get a mayor to just call you, "Hey, what, Maria?" Um, I am so honored to be here delivering the 22nd annual David N. Dinkins Leadership and Public Policy Forum keynote. Um, specifically from Mr. Mayor David Dinkins. Um, I appreciate that he says I'm a dear friend, but Mayor knows that actually when he was um, mayor of the city, we were sparring a lot of the time. And that's what I think is so fabulous because even as a journalist, a young journalist, and I was taking on the mayor and he, um, he calls me a friend, that's kind of wonderful. Uh, thank you to Mayor Michael, Michael Nutter, a new friend, Dean Jano, um, also Professor Fuchs, my long lost friend, where are you? And my son, Raul Ariel Jesus de Todos Los Santos Perez Hinojosa, who has come to see me speak. I know, I love that. Um, so I, I wanna make it clear that I am not speaking about policy. Um, although I have been covering immigration for the entirety of my career, um, this is not a speech about policy. So if you were thinking policy wonk, speechy, not gonna happen. Um, it's a lot about the stories. So I'm gonna tell you, um, you know, when I first came to this campus, um, it was 1979, there were no Mexicans in New York City, there were like 10 of us. Um, it was me uh, here at Barnard, and, um, and then on one, 14th Street, there was a pizzeria and there was a Mexican guy who worked at the pizzeria. There were no, to no tortillas. I had to bring my tortillas from Chicago or have them shipped. Um, and all of that stayed the same until 1986 when I actually, one morning when I was traveling to work at three o'clock in the morning at CBS News and I was in Spanish Harlem and I heard ranchera music from a bodega and I said, okay, that's it. New York City is gonna change forever. And it has become a city of, um, of Mexican immigrants, of which I am one. But that's kind of my trajectory, how I end up here in New York, is coming to Barnard. And I'm gonna tell you a story, the way I have been telling this story for the longest time, and then I'm gonna do the recent adaptation, and I'm gonna condense it. But almost at every speech, when I'm asked to talk about my own life, um, I tell the story that I came to understand uh, about 25 years ago when I was writing my first memoir, actually my memoir about my son, Raul, who's here. And I asked my mom that story of, mom, so how did we in fact get here? My father, may he rest in peace, was a medical doctor who was recruited by the University of Chicago to be um, a researcher. And, um, and my mother and the four of us, uh, the kids, came six months later from Mexico City via plane, changed planes, 
in Dallas, and then we were going to take a plane from Dallas to Chicago. My father had been given his citizenship immediately, and we were all given green cards. So when we get to the border, I'm sorry, when we get to the airport check-in in Dallas after having landed from Mexico City, my mom, who was dressed to the nines, it was the early 1960s when you flew on planes, you know, kitten heels, pearls, petticoat, with four kids under the age of seven. So like what? Um, and she gets to the immigration agent who looks at all of our green cards. Forgive me if there's anyone from Texas, I'm about to do a Texas accent. And the Texas immigration agent says, Well, Miss Inahosa, I do see that your paperwork is in order here. I do understand that you have uh, yourself a green card, plus your four children all have green cards here. They're, this is a fine thing here, ma'am. There's only one little problem, ma'am. He said, We're going to have to keep the little one. We're going to have to keep the little one in quarantine right here. And my mom said, What? And she said, Well, it's got a little bit of a rash, so we're just going to keep her here in quarantine, but the rest of you can go on up to Chicago. And my mom, small like me, I say, you know, she had like this voice that came from like her gut and it came out of her hands. She didn't really do this, but wrapped around his bicep, you know, with her voice. And she said, sir, my name is Berta Hinojosa and my husband is Dr. Raul Hinojosa. And he has been invited by the president of the University of Chicago to come to this country, sir. We have our papers, sir. Do you understand? We all have green cards, sir. I am coming into this country with my four children. Do you understand, sir? And he said, yes, ma'am, I do. Come on in. Come on in. Right, I know, okay, yeah. That's the way I've been telling the story for over two decades. And it's such a funny story and people love it and my God, my mom, she stood up to an immigration agent, wow. This past summer of 2018, I was in an airport. Um, I'm, I live in airports, I'm on my way to one as soon as I finish this speech. Um, and the phone rang and it was my mom. My mom doesn't often call me because she knows that I'm in transit a lot, so I'm the one that calls her, but she called me and I, so I answered and she was in tears. I was like, mommy, que pasa? Que pasa, mommy? But in tears. Mom, what's going on? She said, mamita, they tried to do it to you. This was you. And I said, what are you talking about, mom? She said, the children, the children that they're taking away, they tried to do it to you. That was you that they tried to take away from me. And you have always laughed at that voice. She said, now I realize, and she's crying. She said, that was my voice of trauma. When he told me he was going to put me into quarantine, put me into quarantine, she said, I lost it. And that voice that you make fun of as like that, you know, Herculean voice was actually my fight or flight. And I was fighting for you. I was fighting for you. So who would have thought that in all of the years that I've been telling my immigration story that it would be in the year 2018 that I suddenly realized those children that we heard crying, they could have been me. And that mother who is ripped apart was my mom. And the question that I've always asked myself, which is, I know you were born in Mexico and that you're an immigrant, but what is this, this overwhelming need to tell the story of immigrants. And now I realize, because maybe, perhaps, this is what trauma looks like. It stays in your brain. In my sense, for the positive, I've dedicated my life to telling these stories. And yet we continue to learn. Because in preparation for this speech, I spoke to Professor Esther Fuchs, and I was telling her this, and she said, oh my god, Maria, the quarantine. That's what they did to the immigrants in Ellis Island. And me, a Mexican immigrant from Chicago who never thought I had anything to do with the immigrants who came onto this island that is my home now, now Esther Fuchs taught me you were them too. The number of people who were not let in because they were put into quarantine. And my question is, what exactly were they going to do with me? Where were they going to put me in 1962 in the airport in Dallas? So this, queridos y queridas, is not new. This is not new. In fact, we have to have context, right? They took the children away of our founding mothers and fathers, our Native American, our indigenous people. They took their children away because they said that they were savages. 
they took the children away of the men and women who were enslaved because they said that they were property. They took the children away of Japanese American citizens because they said that we were not trustworthy. And they take away the children of immigrants now. It's not new. It has absolutely gotten worse. The biggest challenge that we have for telling this story as journalists is that we're not allowed to tell this story, in fact. Unless you have deep sources who are prepared to, to give you access to a child, and many aren't because of all of those ethical responsibilities. So we can't tell this story. They're held in private detention facilities that are overrun by government officials, and you can never get in to see and talk to the children. How is this possible that we as journalists in a country with the First Amendment and freedom of the press cannot tell this story, that we are prohibited from telling this story? And so what I ask you to do is what I do, which is to open our eyes. This story is happening everywhere around us, not far from us. We're on 116th Street, nine blocks away from us. On 125th Street, there is a shelter where they hold these immigrant children right here. They're building one in downtown Philadelphia. They are opening these shelters everywhere. So open your eyes and begin to ask questions. Wouldn't you want someone asking questions if, they was, if these were your children? So I travel in the world with my eyes wide open. I travel in this country with my eyes wide open. And I'm going to share something that I just recently experienced. Um, I flew down to the border. And at, a, at the airport in the border in McAllen, when I arrived at 11 o'clock at night, I saw a group of children. I have been seeing now children in airports. They're being transported. They're being moved. Some say that they are being reunited. Others call this government trafficking. Others call this kidnapping of children, holding them for ransom. But what we do know is that they are being taken from place to place. And if you're in the airports, you can see this if you open your eyes. So I saw a group of children, young men. It was 11 o'clock at night on a Wednesday night. And um, they were all wearing the same colored sweatshirts. Kind of think you're maybe a soccer team. But I'm, and so I'm trying to train you to do the same thing. And so I went and I spoke to the adult, and I started asking questions, and he said, who are you? And I said, I'm a journalist. He said, you can't speak to these children for their own safety. Remember that. We've been told that before. The Japanese American citizens were being put into internment camps. I'm not exactly sure what that is, actually being imprisoned for their own safety. We are not allowed to speak to, this ch to these children for their own safety, determined by who, I ask. They whisked those boys away as fast as he could with a chaperone when he started realizing that I, was, I had questions. And on the return, I flew out of McAllen and spotted another group of kids. And the same thing, I was like, is, there a, is that a family? Are they brothers and sisters? And actually, no. And the look on their faces maybe is the thing that you can spot because they look like the pain of the shock has been so profound that now it's better if they just don't feel anything, if they just travel the world like zombies, being moved from place to place and not spoken to. So I saw a little girl, and um, she happened to smile at me because I looked at her. I saw her. I made on co eye contact with her on purpose, and she smiled. And and then I said, oh my God, are these, these are the kids. These are the kids. These are the kids that this president has said, we are full. These are the kids that he says are animals, infiltrators, drug traffickers, gangbangers, human traffickers. These are the kids. And... And, you know, to speak to a little girl who's 10 years old who doesn't know 
where she is or where she's going, and all she can say is, they separated me from my uncle. We came together. So family separation policy continues to this day. It is a challenge when you have a president who lies on a daily basis to believe anything. But the family separation continues. And the family separation, the children coming, goes back to Elian Gonzalez. Do you remember Elian Gonzalez? Do you remember what happened when that child was taken from his cousin's arms and taken forcibly back and reunited with his father? That used to be what the United States of America stood for, as complicated as that moment was. But at that moment, we were reporting, myself and Rose Arce, also a graduate of Columbia University for CNN, we were reporting about the fact that the numbers of children already were being tracked by the government and they knew that they were going to be increasing. Why? Because when I was a student right here across the street, there was intervention by this government in Central America, in El Salvador, in Nicaragua, in Guatemala, and so those areas were being destabilized and so already men, women, and children were coming at the time. Right here on this campus in the early 1980s is when we were understanding what was happening with the U.S.-Central America relationships, and yet, if you talk to people now, they're like, Central America? United States relationship? What? How could we forget? There is no historical responsibility. And so, it is a complicated situation. Somehow it seems normal now that we know that there are children who are being held in cages. How did we get to this point? I mean, that's my obsession, right? Or maybe it's that we never left the other point where I started taking children away. But whatever it is, somehow in our country, this issue of immigration, and we know this, we're academics, we have studied this, but the issue of making a population to dehumanize them purposefully why is it that we can all be here okay living another day when we know that children are being taken from their parents in the normalization of it? The responsibility of our news media to report on it every single day, does immigration do well for ratings? I'm asking you difficult, challenging questions. But the fact is, is that I worry about how this moment will be captured. That in the history books, the questions will be posed just as they were posed when this country and this government, not this administration, but this government turned away Jewish refugees from the St. Louis who were coming in search of home and docked in Cuba and were reject rejected docked in the United States and were rejected, docked in Canada, were rejected, and only, I think, 98 were allowed off, and so many of them we know were returned to their deaths. Is this the way we will talk about this moment? It is uncomfortable. It brings me no joy to make these kinds of comparisons. But we are at a point where the dehumanization is such that we know that this administration is okay with pregnant women sleeping on gravel. We know that they are okay with children sleeping outside on the cement in Mexico when they should be legally allowed into the United States to apply for asylum. This is a crisis that this administration has created. Yeah, there is permanent damage. What we know, what we've covered on Latino USA and on In the Thick on our politics podcast is that in fact, um, UCLA brain neuroscientists have known that when children, babies, children are exposed to trauma, it is impacted in their brains forever. It doesn't go away, it's like a plaque buildup. It happens and it just stays there. And I, I asked the professor to explain this to me, how do the children then get over this? And she said, well, imagine you have a child whose arm was hacked off when they were a baby. Some children will grow up and be able to function perfectly without their arm. They'll not use one or get another one or incorporate or, you know, whatever. Or, or, but other children, will never be able to recuperate 
from the loss of that arm. That's what we're talking about. We don't know which of these kids will make it or not. So um, for me, an essential moment, and I share this in ever, every lecture that I give, is something that I learned actually not from my radical Latino, Latina studies professors at Barnard. Actually, we didn't even have Latino, Latina studies. We had Latin American studies, and we had to fight for that. Love you, Barnard. Love you, Barnard. Um, but what I, this one phrase, there is no such thing as an illegal human being, you know, which people think, well, Maria Hinojosa, she must have learned that, you know, she's a radical Latino studies, you know, she must have learned that from, no, 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 actually, that phrase, there is no such thing as an illegal human, human being, was told to me by the person who could not be any more different than me. May he rest in peace, Elie Wiesel, who survived the Holocaust and won the Nobel Prize when I met him at CNN and I walked up to him, something again just led me. Of all questions, I went straight up to him and I said, Mr. Wiesel, please, I'm a, I'm a journalist and I need to understand terminology. What do you think about the terminology illegal immigrants to be used? He said, Maria, please do not ever refer to a human being as illegal. There is no such thing as an illegal human being. They may have committed an illegal act, but they themselves are not illegal. What is the first thing that the Nazis did was to declare the Jews to be an illegal people. It is the first step in dehumanizing. And so the consequences of dehumanizing, my friends, fellow colleagues, journalists, Americans, this is what it looks like when over and over and over and over and over and still in some of our mainstream news media, people, human beings, are referred to as illegals. What does it matter then if they're fed or not? They're just a bunch of illegals. What does it matter if they're sexually assaulted? They're just a bunch of illegals. I understand, look, it's, it's really challenging to be a Mexican immigrant woman journalist in the United States today. <laughs> a lot of days it's a little, a little challenging, but when I feel challenged, I think back to my American heroes. I understand my role as a journalist who is an immigrant, who is a woman of color in this country, and I think back to my heroes, Frederick Douglass. If Frederick Douglass could be born into slavery and publish his own newspaper, certainly I can do this work. If Harriet Tubman could have liberation dreams, certainly I can stay and do this work of revealing these stories to you. As journalists of color, it's like I feel like we are watching the canaries dying in the mines, and we're screaming, they're dying. And oftentimes the response has been to us, can you calm down? Can you calm down? Can you calm down, Maria? Maybe you're a little bit too immigranty. Maybe you're a little bit too Mexican-y. Maybe you're a little bit too close to the story, calm down. I'm not gonna calm down. And I'm not gonna calm down not because I'm a Mexican immigrant. It's because I'm an American citizen. That's why I'm not gonna calm down. It took us 50 years to get here. It took us 50 years of challenging the narrative of us as being an immigrant country, and this is where we are. It's gonna take 50 years, and each one of you, each one of us, to be front and center in this fight that again originated with the hatred towards Native American bodies, followed with the hatred of African bodies, and is the hatred of immigrant bodies now. And what we need to do, and my role as a journalist, even though I'm very tough, like the way I was with Mayor Dinkins and, and put up with it, even though I, I'm very tough, because I, I had to raise my hand to become an American citizen, so I take this very seriously. But I also move in this world, I hope, with a tremendous amount of love. I love this country. I actually love this campus. I love being here to speak to you and sharing my truth. And the fact that we're talking about this makes me very proud of being an American citizen. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Have a great conference. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please give a warm welcome to the Professor of International and Public Affairs and Political Science and Director of the Urban and Social Pro Policy Program at Columbia University's School of the International and Public Affairs, Dr. Esther Fuchs. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to, it's my pleasure to be here uh, to welcome you all to our panel discussion this evening uh, for the Mayor Dinkins Public Policy Forum and uh, to thank Maria Hinojosa for that extraordinary keynote address uh, and for all that she does every day as a journalist and as an advocate. Um, it was really extraordinary to have her with her, us tonight painting that portrait of the experience of immigrant children right here in the United States today. So you all know what our topic is tonight, protecting immigra immigrant children, a policy crisis. So it should come as no surprise to all of you attending the Dinkins Forum that we view it government's responsibility to protect immigrant children. We have also known from clear empirical evidence that the Trump administration is not protecting immigrant children at the border. And yes, this is a public policy crisis. This evening's discussion will focus on how this crisis was precipitated. What, if it's, what have its consequences been for the health and well-being of immigrant children? And what can we as citizens do to change current policy? It's equally important for us not just to understand this problem, but to do something about it. And I want to offer some interesting and what I think relevant data before we begin. That is data as in facts, facts, something that we are often not shared with by some elected officials in this country today. So first, on the general problem of unauthorized immigrants. immigrants. So based on US Census Bureau data, have to bring that data, unauthorized immigrants are now a smaller share of the US foreign born population when you, than they were in 2007. And at the same time, the share of legal immigrants has risen. In 2016, unauthorized immigrants made up 24% of the foreign-born population as compared to 30% in 2007. So, fact number one, unauthorized immigration to the U.S. is declining. Did you hear me clearly? Yes. Declining and has been since 2007. That's according to the Census Bureau. Second, According to a January 2019 Pew Public Opinion Survey, 62% of, America, 62 of Americans say immigrants strengthen the country because of their hard work and talents. Only 28% say immigrants are a burden on the country because they take jobs, housing, and health care. And of course, you might guess there is however, a strong partisan divide. But fact number two, most Americans have a favorable view of immigrants and it has been getting more favorable over time. Okay, that's according to the Pew Public Opinion Survey, which as far as I know, no one has uh, disavowed yet. Third, when it comes to separating children and families at the border, there is strong opposition from a broad-based public. According to the University of Maryland Critical Issues Poll, just fielded late in March of this year, 65% of respondents and 72% of those under the age of 35 say separating families is unacceptable. 
Even for Republicans, this is more challenging. Only 49% of Republicans say separation is acceptable. Fact number three, most Americans think President Trump's policy of separating families at the border is unacceptable. So, just as the public's view of immigrants in general has become more positive and the number of unauthorized immigrants is actually declining, our president is choosing to ignore facts and public opinion, implementing some of the most draconian policies toward immigrant families and their children in our history, and at the same time challenging fundamental principles of our democracy. For most Americans, it is hard to understand or accept President Trump's immigration policies. So this evening's panel really could not have been chosen by Mayor Dinkins and Linda and myself a little bit, um, I think in a better way. They will help us understand what is actually happening and what we can do about it. And it's my pleasure to introduce all of them. First, Lee uh, Gellert. Many of you I know are familiar with Lee, who's a lawyer for the ACLU National Office. He's argued dozens of notable civil rights cases and cases on national security in federal court and the Supreme Court. And during the past two years, he's brought several groundbreaking challenges to the Trump administration's immigration policies. And I have to say, because we're here, he's also a graduate of Columbia Law School. Dr. Erwin Redlener, at the very end of our table, is a director and founder of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia's Earth Institute. He also holds a professorship in health policy at Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health and in pediatrics at the College of Physicians and Surgeons right here at Columbia. Some of you may know Dr. Redlener's work. He is, I think, one of the most extraordinary advocates and practitioners who has, you may know, was a co-founder of the Children's Health Fund and has been both bringing health care and influencing public policy around issues of children, children's health for decades now. Um, I can think of no one who has done more or cares more about children in this country than Dr. Erwin Redlener. You know what? You're the doctor, he's the mayor, and I say you're right about politicians. There's nobody who cares more about children than Mayor Dinkins. That is so true. Michael Nutter, he was the 98th mayor of his hometown of Philadelphia. I wish we could claim him for New York now, but he doesn't want to let go of Philadelphia. And, uh, he was a two-term mayor there and, of course, had to leave that office because of term limits. Some mayors abide by the laws of term limits. <clears throat> I can say that. After serving almost 15 years in the Philadelphia City Council, uh, he rose to the position of mayor. That's actually pretty hard to do, Mayor Nutter. I'm not sure how you did that. Maybe the way you fixed the fiscal crisis in Philadelphia and actually got reelected. I think he's like the only mayor I know who could do something like that. It's pretty amazing. We are very fortunate to have Mayor Nutter here as the inaugural David N. Dinkins Professor of Professional pa Practice in Urban and Public Policy right here at Columbia at SEPA. And he uh, received his degree from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. I guess that's why you're probably going to always be from Philadelphia, huh? And finally, my friend Stephen Choi who is the executive director of the nation's larger, largest immigrant rights coalition, right here in New York City, comprising 200 
immigrant organization. It's, the mind reels when I think about the work you do with the Immigration Coalition and the fact that you can get that extraordinary group of not-for-profits to agree about anything, because that's one of the hardest things to do for those of us who know and have tried. Uh, Steve has really pushed the envelope on the work of the Immigration Coalition. His, the influence is not just here in New York City, but it's in national policy as well. He received his J, I'm gonna say this even though it breaks my heart, his JD from Harvard Law and an MA from the University of Hawaii and a BA from Stanford. Um, we claim him for New York anyway. So it's a pleasure for me to welcome uh, this panel to the David Dinkins Forum this evening. I want to really start with Lee, uh, because I think he'll be able to help us set the stage for, for really understanding what's going on. Lee, your work at the ACLU has been critical in ensuring that immigrants have recourse in the courts, even while President Trump has tried to establish punitive immigration policies, often through executive fiat. And currently, you are the lead attorney challenging President Tr Trump's family separation policies, part of the topic of what we want to talk about today. So could you provide us with some context for this court case and explain to us what President Trump policies toward undocumented mothers and children really are at the Mexican border and what actually happened to current policy and can you explain how this divergence actually happened? So that's the easy question to start us off tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you um, for inviting me, and thank you, Mayor Dinkins, for having me here. Um, yeah, so we are in a tough word, as you know. Is that Michael? No, is this mic not on? There we go. There you go. Okay. It's on. So, you know, it, it, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We are in a tough period for immigrants. Um, I think everyone knows that. Whether it gets even worse, we'll have to see. In the last couple of days, there have been reports that it will get worse, that family separation may well restart. We'll see. Um, but even if it doesn't restart, even if things don't get worse, they've been pretty bad. What I want to start by saying is that you know, a lot, immigration's a difficult issue in a lot of ways, and reasonable people can disagree about a lot of macro immigration policy, and not everyone agrees with the ACLU about its views on certain macro immigration issues. But I think family separation is one of those issues that should not be a partisan issue. And I think that was really the shocker for the Trump administration. I think they had, assume that they had dehumanized the immigrant population to such an extent that when they started family separation, there wouldn't be pushback. And as we all know, there was pushback. I mean, I've been at the ACLU for more than 25 years. The family separation issue is the closest I've seen to having a real civil rights moment. I mean, obviously, it doesn't rise to the level of what we saw in the 60s, but it was a real civil rights moment with people taking to the streets, protests, uh, there were op-eds, I mean, and it was not partisan, right? Laura Bush came out and wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post, pushing back the Pope, conservative reverends, and the administration finally issued an executive order. It was filled with holes, and that's why the court case still needed to go on. But the president did issue an executive order saying no more family separation. As far as I know, that's the only time the president has ever backed off on a domestic issue, and it was cause of the, because of the public outcry. And, you know, I think any civil rights lawyer will tell you that there's om only so much structural, lasting, systemic change you can receive through the courts, and that it has to be surrounded by public outcry. And I think that, to the extent there was a silver lining in family separation, that was it, that the public showed mm -hmm. that it did care, yep. that it still will speak out, and I think that's the challenge for us, is how to keep that going. In terms of the specifics of family separation, what we had been hearing in the fall of 2017 is that families have been separated, but we weren't sure how many, how often the administration was denying that they had a policy. And so we began looking into it, and finally I got a call in the beginning of February 
uh, this 2018, saying that there was a Congolese mother being detained in San Diego had lost her child. And so I went out there to see her to sort of get a sense, a concrete sense of what was happening. At this point, we had heard that there may be four to 500 families that were separated, but we hadn't been able to talk to any, as Maria mentioned, you know, that's often a difficult thing to get to see the families out at the border. And when I talked to this mom, I, I was shocked by what I saw, and I've visited a lot of immigrants in detention centers, and she had lost, I think, over 100 pounds. She was gaunt, hadn't been sleeping, and she recounted the story of losing her child. By then, it was about three and a half months. She explained, and maybe some of you have seen her and her daughter on the cover of the New York Times Sunday Magazine last summer. Um, she had explained how she had fled for her life with her then six-year-old daughter from the Congo. It took them four months to get here, riding buses by walking, eating out of garbage cans, begging for money, sleeping outside, finally got her. And contrary to what the administration was saying, that you won't lose your child if you come to a port of entry and apply for asylum legally, she did exactly that. She came to a port of entry, applied for asylum lawfully with her daughter. Four days later, they brought her into an office and brought the daughter to a separate office. They handcuffed the mother and said, you're gonna be going to a detention center. And at that moment, she heard her child screaming, Mommy, please don't let them take me away. Please don't let them take me away. They took the daughter to Chicago. They didn't tell the mother where the daughter had been for four days. By the time I got to see her, it was at the four-month mark. The daughter had had to celebrate her seventh birthday by herself in a Chicago facility. The mother had no sense of what was going on. She would spoke to her daughter a few times, but neither one had any idea what was going on. We filed that lawsuit on behalf of her initially and because we knew it would take a few more weeks to file a national class action and this mother needed help immediately. And the government said, well, we thought maybe she could be a trafficker. And you know, of course, the, the mother looked identical to the daughter, but also the daughter had been screaming, mommy, mommy, don't let them take me away. And the judge just finally cut through all of it and said, well, if you were really unclear, did you do a DNA test, did you offer them? Of course, the government hadn't. They gave her a DNA test, and of course, it was the mother. And I was at that reunion in Chicago when they were reunited, and it was as raw emotionally as anything I have seen in doing this work. And we then filed the national class action and ultimately got an injunction in June of 2018. By that time, there were 2,600 families that had been separated. I think we had expected to see maybe a few hundred. And we had also hoped that this six-year-old was an aberration. It turns out, as I'm sure all you know, that there were babies and toddlers who were taken away. Um, they're now, it's now been reported that there, we have reports, you know, we get the reports through the litigation that there are at least 3,000 families separated. Even worse, a few months ago, there was an internal investigation by an HHS watchdog and they found that there may be thousands more families that have been separated that were never reported publicly to the court or to us. The government has taken the position that it's too burdensome to identify these children and they don't want to do it. The court put its foot down, but now the government just recently, a few days ago, said, well, we'll try and identify them, but we want up to two years to do it. It's outrageous. And so you take a two-year-old, that's two more years they're going to be separated from their parents. You know, and the numbers tell one story, but I think ultimately it's the little acts of individual cruelty that, that really tell the story of family separation. And I think, you know, the doctor will go into more about the actual medical effects on the children, but it's been the worst thing I've seen in the 25 plus years I've been doing this work. You know, little stories, I mean, one child, a four-year-old boy, needs glasses and the parents very modest means scrape together the money to get him glasses and also to get him a special glasses case because they knew if his glasses ever broke they wouldn't be able to afford a second pair when they came to take away the little four-year-old he fortunately was wearing his glasses but he didn't have his glasses case he wasn't able to get his glasses case so all day long all the mother thinks about and i think any parent here can identify with this all she thinks about is, is my little boy have his glasses? Can he see? If they break, will they get him a new pair of glasses? Or is he just walking around not being able to see? Another father told me 
you know, all I wanted is to be able to tell my seven-year-old boy they were going to take him away and let me brace him for it, give me five minutes. Instead, the guard just came up and screamed it out loud, we're taking you away now. Didn't even give the father the courtesy to tell him. An 18-year-old, an 18-month-old baby, the mother made them strap the baby into the car. The boy was screaming and crying. They wouldn't let the mother soothe the boy. She had to close the car door, and like all 18-month-olds, the, the boy was conditioned to turning his head around to see his mother walk around the car to get into the driver's seat, you know, so that the mother would drive away with him. Well, the car just pulls away, and the mother's watching this 18-month-old and crying and looking at his mother. And it's just case after case where three, four, five-year-olds would literally be begging, please don't take me away. And it got so bad that at one point, the guards started telling the parents, well, we're just taking your parent, your, your child for a shower, you know, with oblivious to how that resonated with World War II. Um, it's just been as absolutely harsh as you can. And, you know, and I don't want to obviously leave the medical stuff for Dr. Redletter, but, you know, just when I visit the kids, you know, and I visit a little, for, uh, one family was one of the named plaintiffs. The mother just told me the f little four-year-old, now that he's been reunited, just keeps asking, are they going to come and take me away again? Are they going to come and take me away again? And it, it, that, that kind of vulnerability and that kind of trauma is what all the doctors and you know, the whole medical community said would happen, and now sort of seeing it concretely, it's absolutely right. And it's not just the children that have been traumatized, it's also the parents. Because the parents, many of whom are very young parents, had their children ripped away. When the children are reunited, they are so angry at their parents because they don't understand, obviously don't understand at that age, that their parents couldn't help them. So they see their parents watching as they're taken away and they're screaming, Mom, Dad, don't let them take me. And the parents are standing there hopeless, just saying sometimes be brave or just, they're, even the, the parents may even be in handcuffs. And the children get back to the parents and they're so resentful, constantly asking, why didn't you stop them from taking me? Didn't you want me? And so for these parents, their whole relationship with their child has been distorted and the parents are racked with such guilt of whether they should have brought the children. Um, and obviously they had no choice and that's one of the things that's, that, that's so horrible about the policy is it's not just that it's cruel, but it's gratuitous. I mean, there's no way these desperate people were gonna not come. Every parent I, I met, I asked them, would you have come anyway if you knew your child was gonna be taken away? And they all just throw up their hands and shrug, well, what choice did I have? I couldn't let my child be killed. And so they had to come, and so the cruelty was just completely gratuitous. Gratuitous cruelty is what the Washington Post called it early on. And I think that that's exactly right. And family separation is one thing, unfortunately, you know, and it may be the thing that's gotten the most attention, but there is a lot of cruelty going on at the border. What we're seeing now is a lot of focus on asylum seekers, making fun of asylum seekers, and audiences laughing. I think this weekend there was an audience that was laughing when the president was making fun of asylum seekers. And people are not remembering their history that now Central Americans need help, but it was other groups in the past. Um, and the president has a very simple narrative that sometimes will, you know, now he's moved to, we just don't have any room for anybody. But before he was saying, well, just go apply legally. And that can fool a lot of people. He has a big bully pulpit. And that seems like a simple narrative. Well, if you want asylum, go apply legally. But the truth is that every time I've been in Tijuana, what you see is, the people are lined up for months and months because they're only processing a few asylum seekers legally each day. They're refusing to send resources there and they have plenty of resources to process the asylum seekers. So the parents and children are sleeping in the most squalid conditions in Tijuana and other places in Mexico in dangerous, dangerous conditions. They're being picked off by cartels and yet you hear the American public sometimes parrot back, oh, well, they can apply legally. So I think that's the challenge for us to get out those facts. And it's also people sometimes don't even know where the port of entry is, where the port of entry could be 500 miles away and they're on foot with their four-year-old. So we have a lot of work to do, I think, to make sure that we continue telling a human story about what's going on. Ultimately, you know, I can go on TV and talk about the rule of law, 
but people are going to click through that, right? That's people's eyes glaze over. Um, we need to tell human stories. I think that's why family separation broke through, because we were able to tell those human stories. After a while, we were able to get those those families out there and let people see exactly what was happening. I think that's going to be the challenge going forward is to tell human stories about the asylum seekers at the border because it can't all be done through the courts. And if we talk just about the rule of law and abstractions, I don't think that we are going to break through. There's too much noise now. Um, so that's really our challenge is how to keep the public engaged as much as us going into court. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, Mayor Nutter, you know, when it comes to understanding the issues of immigrants facing our country, we have a lot to learn from your work in Philadelphia and as president of U.S. Conference of Mayors. So I'm hoping you could tell us about how the mayors are handling directives from Washington that don't comport with their own policies. and maybe talk a little bit about sanctuary cities and how mayors are really dealing with the current yeah. federal immigration policy because we do know that some of these families which are being separated at the borders, kids are being sent to cities including right. New York right. all over the country. Sure. Um, Dr. Fuse, thank you uh, very, very much. And Lee, thank you for uh, uh, laying things out. Um, I'm going to answer the question, but um, as you were going through uh, that recitation, the what kept going through my mind, and I mean, people know that I'm not an attorney, but I mean, that's never stopped me from um, <laughs> giving uh, perspective or advice. Uh, it just seems to me that the level of detail, in fact, that you all are able to lay out, I mean, it, it would appear that the United States of America um, has actually create, uh, uh, created um, and generated a significant number of human rights abuses, uh, which literally, you know, may be more appropriate either at the UN uh, or uh, in the World Court. Um, it, it, it is, I, I don't know how some of these folks uh, do what they do. Um, and we know from other circumstances, you know, just following orders often is not a legitimate <coughs> excuse. Um, there, there, there just has to be a human component uh, to all of this. And you're right, the uh, television did bring us, as television has in the past, uh, it changed the tide of the Vietnam War, it changed the tide of uh, the civil rights movement. People heard stories, but when they saw in their living rooms every night uh, body bags coming home from Vietnam or uh, dogs and fire hoses turned on African Americans down south, uh, the lynchings and the beatings, uh, the American public changed their mind. And I think we've seen that uh, shortly after the current occupant of the White House uh, came into office with the Muslim ban. That's right. Cities exploded at the airports and the folks there protesting were not all Muslims. Right. Uh, and uh, we continue to see these activities uh, all across the United States of America. So Dr. Fuse asked a question about cities. By sheer coincidence, um, a guest speaker in my class today uh, was former Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson. What? Talking about immigration, talking about the border, talking about sanctuary cities, talking about the former program Secure Communities, talking about the now former program uh, Priority Enforcement, uh, Priority Enforcement Program, uh, and now uh, I don't even know what the program is uh, with regard to cities. Uh, when I was in office, uh, I, uh, Secure Communities was in place. Um, there are two issues uh, that I raised w directly with President Barack Obama. Um, and I loved virtually everything that they were doing. We worked in great partnership. Uh, but one of the two things that I told the president that I could not support uh, was secure communities uh, because it was overly broad. Um, you've got a mother or a father go out to take their kids to school, go to the market, uh, get pulled over for a broken taillight, and the next thing you know, uh, they're being deported. 
uh, from the United States of America. You, you can't chase everybody. It's an inappropriate use of resources. And there are some very dangerous people, uh, some immigrants, some homegrown, some citizens forever. Um, and so I'm against criminals. Whether you've been here for generations or got here last week, I'm against criminals. And there are some very dangerous people here in the United States of America. Uh, and if we're going to spend our time and energy and resources, we should be trying to get rid of or uh, take out of the country, if they're not legally here, uh, very dangerous people. Uh, but folks who are undocumented about paperwork and came here fleeing the insanity of what might be going on in their home country, but have committed no other crime and are not a danger to society, uh, we should be trying to figure out how to get them on a path to citizenship uh, to do the right thing that many want to, uh, and at least recognize uh, what they had to go through to get here in the first place. Uh, nobody was chasing me at 55th and Larchwood uh, in West Philadelphia. I became a citizen because I was born here. My parents were already, were, were already here, and so uh, there was no long journey. The journey was from Misericordia Hospital at 53rd and Larchwood to 5519 Larchwood Avenue. That was a big journey uh, that I took to you know, uh, uh, citizenship. And so um, most of the mayors across the country are completely ignoring uh, directives out of Washington, D.C. Um, we don't want people going underground. We want our citizens to have a good relationship. We want those who are with us, uh, however they arrive, uh, to uh, be able to uh, take care of themselves and their families. So uh, while I was in office, um, I issued an executive order uh, directing every department and agency under the executive branch that they had to provide services to anyone who was in the city of Philadelphia, regardless of their documentation or lack thereof that we were not going to be an arm of the federal government, that it was not our responsibility to check and see who had their papers in order, but if you're here and you need service, you're gonna get service. I told the president that I could not support the Secure Communities Program, but if they ever changed it and made it more narrow, uh, that we would reconsider, um, and not because of me, um, but through leadership at the U.S. Conference of Mayors and with tens of of mayors across the country, I think we ultimately convinced the President and uh, uh, Secretary Johnson uh, to change the program, which they did, to priority enforcement, which was targeted, much more narrow, going after people who had already been convicted previously of a variety of different serious violent crimes, and that if you asked us, uh, is this person in your custody, and told us why you wanted to know, and could show that they had been convicted of certain enumerated crimes, we would let you know approximately uh, when they were being released. We would not hold anyone past their uh, date uh, because that is illegal. And if you really want someone held, go get a federal judge to sign a warrant, which any mayor uh, or a keeper of a, a prison or jail uh, would, uh, would recognize. Um, but just having a detainer was not enough. I think cities will continue to resist uh, many of these uh, overbroad uh, efforts. Uh, we are not trying to drive our citizens underground. We want them to have a good working relationship uh, with uh, law enforcement. Uh, and um, uh, the lawsuits will continue, whether at the state or uh, city level. Uh, and there is a resistance uh, to uh, these uh, policies. Um, and ultimately, I think the American public will continue to reject uh, family uh, separation as inhumane uh, and an inappropriate uh, national policy. Uh, but the fights will be on the ground in cities all across the United States of America. Thank you, Mayor Nutter. I... So yeah, the fights will be on the ground in cities and that leaves us, leads us to our next panelist, uh, Steve Choi, who uh, is doing this work on the ground in cities through uh, the Immigration Coalition, where he has 200 member organizations and many, many other organizations that he's, that he's brought into his coalition. So, Steve, uh, can you tell us 
I think two things would be really important for you to talk about. Um, how are the current policies impacting families in your coalition in New York City? And can you tell us a little bit about coalition building, your partner organizations, how you've been <coughs> engaging them, and whether you think uh, New York is an outlier or there's a model here for other cities, because I think this part of the work is as important as the lawsuits which are going on, which mm -hmm. are, are very important. Yeah. So thank you, and, and thank you, Mayor Dinkins, for inviting me in. It's always a pleasure of mine to come and speak to his class and his forum. I, I just want to follow up on one thing and just note that I do think cities, whether they're led by Democrats, whether they're led by Republicans, often are the most sane elected officials and are home <laughs> to the most sane elected officials when it comes to immigration because they see firsthand how important immigrants are, whether they're undocumented or not. You know, and, and this is something I like to tell folks. There was a mayor, talk, as, as Mayor Nutter was talking about you know, sanctuary cities and things like that, there was a mayor of New York City who felt so strongly about quote unquote sanctuary policies. And he went out and said, you know what, if, uh, uh, this is literally his quote, he said, if you are undocumented and you're here and you're hardworking, we don't want you to feel like you're a fugitive. We don't want you to feel like you're a criminal. And so he defended his sanctuary city policy all the way up to the Supreme Court. That mayor was not Bill de Blasio, it was not Mayor Dinkins, it was Mayor Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> so I, I think it now it may, may not be the Rudy Giuliani that we see on TV today. Maybe he needs to go to SEPA and, and, and take a Michael Nutter's class. Um, <laughs> but I, <laughs> that, that's probably not enough for him right now. <laughs> no, I, think I think he so. needs a little bit of a stronger he's treatment. Lost, but I think it goes to the mind. fact that mayors often who are seeing on the ground what kind of impact immigrants can have, and I see this across the country, I see this across the state, whether you're a Democrat or you're Republican, you can see the value, you understand that immigrants are not criminals and they're not sucking up public resources and they're not anything that Donald Trump says that they are. And so I actually think that a lot of the political work that can and should be done moving forward has got to be done by mayors. Um, taking, taking you back, uh, Professor Fuchs, to the first question, really about how immigrant communities have been affected. I mean, they have been affected in so many ways. And those have been really big, and they've also been small. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is the White House, this administration's immigration policy is run by a racist. Let's just be frank about this. Stephen Miller, the architect about, of the Trump administration's immigration policy, is a white supremacist. Let's not beat around the bush. And you see this in, in ways both big and small, in the cancellation of DACA, and of course, you know, how folks with temporary protected status is, are, are being endangered deportation raids that are happening, ICE officers in courts ready to arrest folks who are coming to a house of justice in these big visible ways. But they also happen in, in smaller and arcane ways, right? Policy changes that say that the spouses of H-1B visa holders, you know, professionals coming over, policy changes that say that the spouses can't work. Why? There's no good reason for that except to be frank, racism and white supremacism. They, they just want to really dehumanize, otherize, um, attack immigrants in every which way. Public charge, another thing, right? Doesn't get the headline news, it doesn't you know, get the tweets um, up the wazoo, but public charge is an example of how Stephen Miller has figured out how to use the regulatory power of the federal government in a way to actually attack immigrants. Public charge, basically what it is, is it says that uh, essentially, if you are receiving benefits of any kind, it doesn't matter if they're federal benefits, then that's gonna jeopardize your ability to become a legal resident. It's gonna jeopardize your ability to adjust your status, become a citizen down the line. And so the number of people who are actually potentially affected, it's a regulatory change. It's not a bill passed in Congress, it's not an executive order. But that one small change intimidates and scares so many immigrants from getting food, from getting health care, from getting after-school care. 
That's just another way. So, so when we think about the way that immigrant families are affected, it's in these very big invisible ways and family separation, but it's also in these small ways, and we cannot forget that because that is the true measure. It's not run by logic. It's not, I mean, you all know this already, but it, you know, it's, it really is, it, it is undergirded by a fundamentally racist and white supremacist policy, and we need to call that out for what it is. And, and I would say, you know, it has been a very long two years of, uh, a little bit more than two years of being in this uh, administration. And the world has changed. And immigrant communities in New York have been devastated, let's be real, by this administration's policies. But the silver lining, and I think one that we can build off, is that there are more people who see themselves in the fight than ever before. You know, uh, both Mayor Nutter and Lee mentioned two moments that really stand out to me, and, and it's incredible sort of being in the middle of them. One was exactly one week after Trump took office. Sometimes I, like to, I don't like to say his name. I call him, you know, number 44, but we'll call him Trump. He took office, and one week after he took office, I'll, I'll never forget it, 4.48 p.m. on a Friday, he signed into law the executive order, the Muslim ban executive order. And so... You know, we started to hear later that night that people were being detained at JFK. JFK of all places. And then later the next day on Saturday, on a cold, wintry January Saturday, we heard that dozens of people were being detained at JFK. And we knew that there was something so fundamentally wrong. And so we started to tweet about it, start to tell people to go to JFK, and more and more people start to go to JFK Airport. And I'll never forget it, by the time you know, I went out to JFK that night. There were more than 5,000 people who had made their way to JFK Airport, and the atmosphere was electric. There were people singing, chanting, you know, saying that Muslims were welcome here. It was something that I'd never seen before. And really, Trump had really made the impossible happen. He made people go to JFK of their own accord. Nobody does that. <laughs> but thousands of people made their way to JFK that night. And, you know, I'll never forget this. I, you know, the atmosphere was so electric that, you know, I remember I got on top of this, like, transformer box of the parking lot of JFK Terminal 4, and I said, you know, we have just begun to fight. We need everybody to come out to Battery Park the next day to protest this Muslim ban, and the response that we got was tremendous. And li the next day, literally 12 hours after that, there were more than 20,000 people who came to JFK. That was a civil rights moment. And the second civil rights moment was in the wake of family separation, where again, we realized that there was something different going on. And we called for a march that to go over the Brooklyn Bridge, and 30,000 people showed up that day on a hot, sweltering June day. This is something that we've never seen at the New York Immigration Coalition. We used to organize for weeks and sometimes months, and we would get a couple thousand people. Now, all of a sudden, at the drop of a hat, you could tweet, you could create a Facebook event, and tens of thousands of people could show up. And that's the silver lining. A lot of them are, they're not first generation immigrants and they're not second generation immigrants, but they understand that there's something so immoral and so wrong about this administration's policies that they're ready to come out on a cold, wintry January morning or on a hot, sweltering June day and march with us. What we need to do, though, is we need to translate that into the next step. Because to be, I'm gonna to be totally frank here, the, the kind of appeal, I mean, folks believe in immigrants and they, 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 they think that immigration is good for America, but that support is nowhere near as deep as it needs to be. And if we wanna make that real, if we want to actually have the political vote and the political voice so that people, so that elected officials like this administration will not engage in these policies, we need more and more people. The people who come and march with us or the people who come out to JFK, they need to stand up and say, you know what, when you're talking about immigration, you're not talking about those people over there that the administration is trying to dehumanize or to otherize. You're talking about me. You're talking about me as a third generation, as a fourth generation, as a fifth generation immigrant. And if it's only if we do that and we can translate the kind of civil rights moments that we've seen into a lasting political movement that says they're gonna be there for immigration thick and thin, that 
in the long run is going to be the way that we actually fix this because immigra our immigration system was broken long before Donald Trump came to power. He is just the symptom in so many ways of the kind of n the narrative around immigration. He is, in some ways, is not the cause. He's the symptom. And in order to vanquish this disease, we need to have a long-term movement around immigration. And that means everybody in this auditorium has got to say, when you're talking about immigrants, you're talking about me. Thank you. Very powerful. Our final question for the first round here is for Dr. Redlener. Um, you know, Dr. Redlener, you have been at the forefront of supporting children's health, especially for minority and undeserved populations. And, and now you're, you're in the thick of this immigration issue and the separation of children from their families. You've been focusing your expertise and your energy on this now. And what I'd really like you to do tonight is talk about the impact of this on the health risks facing immigrant children at the border and what you personally have seen uh, and how this is really um, affecting both the families and the rest of us who have to watch this on TV and other forms of social media. Thanks, Esther. And, uh Congratulations to the fellow, fellow, fellow panelists for really great remarks. I, I, I don't know how many of you saw the editorial in today's paper called Immigration Incoherence. Did you miss that? Probably did, because in the Wall Street Journal, and I'm sure <laughs> you know, didn't necess wouldn't necessarily look at that, but it was a very uh, important editorial which described absolute incoherence of the Trump administration immigration policies. And um, I'm mentioning that as a prelude to the answer to your question, Esther, because I'll say this, that every policy, every regulation, every law has human dimensions. And what we're seeing here is an absolute mess of public policy that is resulting in some of this extraordinarily uh, difficult position that we've put children in and their families, by the way, and I think Lee made an important point. This is not just about children. It is about their entire families. And my concern is not just about the health of these children. It's about the general well-being of these children. It's not just about uh, children you know, getting to be healthy or maybe educated, but what are we doing to make sure that we've put no barriers in the, ways, in the way of any child uh, in terms of becoming successful and actually thriving? And what we've seen over this last year in particular uh, with these policies that have been enacted by the Trump administration has been a horrible onslaught of uh, adversities that were deliberately, intentionally focused on innocent children and their families. And I've been working in the field of you know, medically underserved indigent children since 1971 when I was the medical director of what was called VISTA, it's now AmeriCorps Clinic in East Arkansas. Not too long after a very tumultuous uh, period of time during the 60s, and uh, having grown up in the Kennedy-Johnson era, I told colleagues that in 10 or 15 years from 1971, clearly we'd end racism, clearly we'd end poverty, or problems accessing health care for children. I was 100% convinced that was going to be the case. And here we are a lot of decades later, and we're still dealing with one incredible, unbelievable situation after another that affects children. Last May, a year ago, I wrote an op-ed uh, saying that the headline was uh, uh, cruelty uh, in these policies was basically uh, child abuse by government. That was the, the title of the piece. And I thought that now, then, and I think it uh, now. And on May 8th, uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions held a press conference, this is May 8th of 2018, in which he viciously attacked the parents of, of these children who were being separated. And his speech included comments like, if parents are gonna smuggle, smuggle was the verb he used in reference to uh, children, their children across the border illegally, um, then they deserve to pay the consequences. And the consequences were, very defiantly, 
almost gleefully, Jeff Sessions saying, we're going to do this as a disincentive. We want to deter immigration, and this is how we're going to do it, by separating children. One of the most overtly cruel statements, in addition to the actual acts, that I, I really have ever heard in my career. And ironically, that very same day, Melania Trump, that same day, announced her new program or focus on uh, child well-being. I, I thought it was incredible. I wrote, I had written, they need to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, these two people, because they're clearly in different universes, and I guess that goes without saying. The, uh, the issue about this policy of cruelty, which has the ramifications that I'm going to tell you about in a second clinically, uh, the problem is, the reality is, it doesn't work. It does not work as a deterrence. We have not slowed people coming across the border seeking refuge and asylum and opportunity in the, in the United States of America. It simply doesn't work. I was at an ICE facility uh, for women and men in uh, El Paso last September. I spoke to 42 women, almost all of them mothers, and almost none of them had seen their children in weeks. They had no idea when they were gonna see their children, where they were, they were limited to very short phone calls, some of them with older children, and some of them with their spouses. Uh, and I said to them, I have this on recording, secretly recorded on my little spy pen. <laughs> You're not gonna tell me, are you? No. Anyway, I said, uh, would any of you, this, they were all in a group of these 42 women, would any of you not come to America if you knew that the consequence was gonna be separation of your children? Every single one of them said they would still have come. And I asked them if their neighbors and friends would come here knowing what you're going through. And by the way, this ICE detention center was an out and out, it was just a prison. Um, and uh, every one of them said, no, nobody we know would not have been deterred by these crazy policies. So there, there we have this horrible situation of a cruel policy that doesn't even work as, as the president and Stephen Miller and Jeff Sessions wanted it to. So, Two deaths of children under the age of 10 in December, you'll remember. This is the ultimate tip of an iceberg. And what's under that tip is extraordinary damage that we've done to lots of children. And what happens is, first of all, the forceful extraction of a small child from the arms of a mother is immediately traumatic and deeply traumatic. And every one of us on this panel uh, knows what that looks like. And you don't need to be a, a clinician to understand how deeply troubling, how deeply traumatic this is uh, for any child. And the policies, remember, in some of the detention centers for children uh, included that the workers in those centers, by the way, many of whom are quite well-meaning, well and I saw a lot of really caring professionals in these detention centers. But in some of the centers, the workers were not allowed to pick up and comfort a toddler who was crying for a parent. Why? There was some, I guess, cockamamie connection to the fact that there was some exploitation of older children. That goes, everyone knows that. And they extrapolated that concern to young children who could not be comforted by the regulation of the detention center. I mean, people in my field were, we were flabbergasted, and not just people, not just professionals. What human being, what parent would be unaffected by watching a baby and a toddler crying for a parent and a worker not being able to pick up and hug the child and hold the child. I mean, it was one thing after another. So what happens to children who are exposed to this? It's not pretty. It's a phenomenon well researched now over the last 10 or 15 years called toxic stress, which means a level of stress that's virtually intolerable. It has to be dealt with immediately because when you're stressed in a bad way, I mean, there's some good stress in children. It's normal for a child to cry getting in a vaccine. Um, but, and that, that stress is alleviated by a caring parent or other factors. So we learn to deal with stress, but not toxic stress. Not toxic stress. Because toxic stress over a period of time is releasing stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, and so on. The long-term release of those stress hormones causes irreparable changes in the physiology and sometimes the anatomy of a child over time. 
The brain architecture is changed by toxic stress and those hormones. The other conditions which, besides the fact that, that we can have developmental interference and depression, are you waving that at me? No, okay, fine. He's holding the one minute thing. It's okay. no, you're good. Um, so uh, what happens is that the physiological changes associated with high persistent levels of stress hormones leads to other th cardiovascular disease in adults, high blood pressure, and so on. So we cause chronic inflammation from the stress hormones. And by the way, the amelioration of that is not going to be possible for a lot of these children. I think Lee was talking about the reunification of these children with their families. First of all, the atrocity of a U.S. government agency saying we can't find the parents. Yeah. We don't know where they are. We lost track of them. We simply cannot unify. How many of it? How many kids are not reunified? Um, uh, we don't really even know anymore because there's so many. Yeah. That have been, yeah. So, I mean, one thing after another that really shakes the foundation who, of people who want to love our country and its values. We care about that. And I think that does cross partisan lines. But this partisan in the White House is a different animal altogether. It's just absolutely horrifying. So we're dealing with a generation of immigrant children who are going to suffer consequences. And by the way, those consequences are not limited to those children and their families. Those are societal consequences. Mm -hmm. Children who grow up under so much stress, with so much psychological trauma early on, are not necessarily on a trajectory to grow up happy, successful, healthy, thriving adults. It's not going to happen. They left trauma, and they came here for another big whopping dose of more trauma at the intentional hands of people representing us, representing us. So going forward, um, <clears throat> You know, we're going to do, I guess, uh, one of the things that uh, Lee and I have talked about is the, uh, what are the recommendations from, from professionals, mental health or health professionals? What is it that we need to do for these children now to help make sure that they have some shot at getting, having a normal life? That's tough. And we're working together trying to figure that out. But the second thing is we have to, we have to fix immigration. We, we have to fix it. We have an insane system. 103,000 people came across the borders not the regular entry points, in March. In February, it was 76,000. People are overwhelmed. The Customs and Border, Border Protection Agency or Border Patrol is absolutely overwhelmed. And I'll tell you something, they're the culprits, but I also feel deeply sorry for them. These are law enforcement officers who have been given the job to deal with an unmanageable number of people coming, coming across the border. And I'll tell you something, <clears throat> that we haven't really talked about publicly yet. But two things happened recently. One is Border Patrol went to the head of the American Academy of Pediatrics and said, what should we do? They actually did that. And the head of the AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, went to see the Border Patrol officials. And the other thing is that they reached out, of all people, to me. What would be the protocol that the agents should know about and implement so that children who were sick would not fall through the cracks. And I'm, as we speak, I'm working on that with them. So there's lots of problems. Uh, a, a Homeland Security lawyer that I know, uh, who's in California, very senior position, told me that, well, what about all the people that are exploiting children, who are trafficking them? We need to deal with them. So I said to her, why are you going to deal with that very small minority by punishing the vast majority of normal, regular people fleeing the worst possible conditions you can imagine who want refuge in America. Is that fair? I didn't even know that, that you could just wipe away the issue of um, innocent to proven guilty, but apparently you can. Who knew? I mean, the protocol is pretty simple. Don't, don't separate children, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the yeah. uh, last point I just want to make is that Many of the panelists have said we're all in this together and we all have to find our way to do something about this atrocities, these atrocities that are happening under our watch. That means continuing the legal pressure, making sure that health professionals are, are doing whatever they can to protect these uh, kids. But it also means the public, and I think this is what you were experiencing, right. Steve, which is remarkable, and the media. I just want to end with a comment about the media. There's something called the Cayuga Center in New York City. Mm -hmm. It's a center for, uh, I guess, mostly unaccompanied minors. 
And a mom had came, came to uh, New York, I think in September. Her, her two children somehow ended up in Cayuga, and she wanted them. She was, a, she was entitled to get her children. She was legally here. And they kept stalling and stalling. She was hoping to get them uh, by Thanksgiving because we drifted into November. They, didn't, they, didn't, they couldn't get released for whatever reason. Um, now it was Christmas was coming. I want my children for Christmas. And it wasn't happening. So I called up a New York Times reporter named uh, Meredith Jordan who's written quite a bit about this subject, told her what the story was. She called him up. This was the like, Wednesday or something before Christmas. Cayuga said, all right, well, we'll take care of it. By Friday, not taken care of. Called her back, Meredith doesn't have the kids. She calls her back up and she says, uh, listen, I'm doing a story on why you're retaining these children. What is the rationale? What's going on there? In four hours, those kids were released. The problem with that is it's a microcosm. Right. It's two kids. And we need this kind of action on a policy level and for every single child and parent who's caught up in this American disaster. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Red Leonard. Thank you, Erwin. Before we open it up for questions, I just yeah. want to go one more round with the panel. Uh, in the direction that Erwin really took us in the last part of his remarks, because while it's very important to understand the problem, to document it, um, uh, to identify it, uh, those of us who are concerned more broadly with the policy also <laughs> want to do something about it, uh, want to be part of how we make the change, both at the individual and micro level, as we talked about, but, but also at the policy level. And, and I know you've all touched upon this to a, to a certain extent, um, but I didn't hear anybody talk about elections. I didn't hear it. I, I heard litigation, but I want to hear more about what that means. Organizing, um, very profound and important, but the, the translation of public opinion into public policy here um, with this president and this Congress uh, is, is something that I think we need to talk about. And then also more about, are the mayors organizing? Yeah. Are the places where this is happening on the ground in the cities, are we using the public effectively in getting, the, getting some real changes into this policy? Because I started intentionally with the public opinion data. This is one as everybody mentioned, where we have really strong, broad-based support for change uh, in the public. So I'd like everybody to take a shot at addressing any part of this kind of uh, pragmatic question yeah. um, that I think is important for us to address. Well, so I'll start, let me start with Lee, and we'll go, go down the line. Yeah, so I will leave the um, election part to <laughs> others. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, sort of on, a, on an individual level, there are lots of things to do. I, I do want to continue to emphasize how important it is to have public outcry so that people attending rallies, people speaking up, I, I do think is critical. You know, as I said before, this is the one place where the president has backtracked on a domestic policy, and it was only because there was so much outrage, but more importantly, it was partisan outrage. So I think critical to, to figure out those places where you can say, look, maybe we're not going to get macro immigration, comprehensive immigration policy done this year, but let's at least stop some of the cruelty and, and talk to people in a way that can transcend those lines. Um, but, you know, having said that, I do think that immigration's a tricky, a tricky one. I, you know, I don't know where all those polls came from. I, I think on family separation, there was broad and deep opposition. I don't know that on immigration, the opposition is so deep. You know, you may ask people, do you generally think immigrants are it was good? Pew, by the way. Yeah, and so, but that, but I don't think Very it. Very straightforward. It, I don't think it registers how deep the opposition is, mm -hmm. that how much people are willing to go to the mat over immigration. If you ask them basic questions, they say yes, immigrants are good. No, I don't think Trump should do all this stuff about immigrants, but. 
are they willing to go to the mat mm -hmm. on them? And that's I think right. that's a much more important <laughs> issue, and that's really what is the challenge for us, because immigration get very difficult, and all the numbers and the statistics, you know, even, even what Erwin just said about the system being overloaded, I actually would respectfully disagree a little bit. There's no question we need some changes and there's a lot of people, but what the statistics that don't come out are that we have less people crossing the border between ports of entry than in the 2000s. We, you know, I was in court and the government was making these points and I said, look, you know, in 2000, we had 1.6 million people crossing between the border. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna come anywhere close to that, but more importantly, the agency's budget now is 19 billion. It was about 5 billion back then. Wow. There's 19,000 agents. The apprehensions, if you play it out, each agent would only have to apprehend one person, 32 people a year. That's how many agents they have. They don't even know what to do with the money. So they're, and more importantly, they're not actually, they, they make this big deal about how now it's families. Well, the truth is there, that decreases the danger and it decreases how much effort they have to put in. All the families are doing when they talk about <laughs> they're crossing illegally is they're taking one step over the border because they don't really know where to go, sitting down and waiting for an agent to come up to them and say, I'd like to apply for asylum, I'm fleeing this or that. So I, I think I, I want us to be careful about buying into the notion that there's a crisis at the border, that there's so many people. A lot of it is that this administration is not allocating resources in a way to deal with it so that they can have those images on TV. Look how many people here, or throw those statistics out. You never hear the administration say, our budget is 19 billion, we have 19,000 agents. It's quadruple what we used to have when there were even more people coming through. So that, along with that I think we have to work hard to make the opposition deep as opposed to just sort of superficial and broad. So, um, so I, I agree with what you said. So, and it's interesting again, that, uh, Secretary Johnson quoted many of the same uh, stats that, that you did. I think the issue is, you know, how many folks can get processed? Um, and therein may lie some of the crisis. If it's a thousand, that's one thing. If it's, you know, multiple thousands. Um, you know, the system can get somewhat overwhelmed. But I want to go back to, I mean, there's so many parts of this, this thing, because there are so many different messages being sent out, right? So, I mean, at, some, at one point we send the United States Army right. and National Guards from states for this caravan of 5,000 or so folks on foot, barely with shoes on or anything on their feet, women and children, who, and what, what was the United States military gonna do right. with them? These are men and women, brave men and women of the military who go into, go into service primarily to defend us from you know, all kinds of folks who actually do mean us harm, but not 5,000 women and children. <laughs> which just scares the hell out of the American public that somehow we're, I mean, the, the current occupant of the White House, that's what I refer to, right? What we, the, we were being invaded by these folks, which just scares the hell out of people. That's one. Second, back to Steve's point, the other rising of people and the, the demonizing and convincing the American public that well, the other reason we have to keep these folks out is because the reason you don't have a job is because they're going to take your job, which is nonsense. There are jobs in the United States of America that go wanting for employees, and there are jobs in the United States of America that are taken by people that basically white folks don't want. And so they're not a threat. I don't see, I don't, you know, Kennett Square is the mushroom capital of the United States of America. I do not see droves of white folks driving out to Kennett Square <laughs> saying, I want to pick mushrooms. Right. <laughs> no. That's not happening. And so the, all of this demonization of the folks who are coming here, who, whose stats on violence are much lower than homegrown Americans. They're not a violent threat to us. And so there are mixed messages. 
about how much opposition people, because, no, well, these are the people who are going to take my job, so how can I, right? So white people have to decide how much opposition do you want to have to these policies? Where is the religious community, the family values people, yeah. on the separation of children from their families? Well, we actually saw this because, you know, African Americans, like we have some um, amount of experience with this because a hundred plus years ago, we were separated from our parents. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing over and over, and the same thing that happened in Germany, and the same thing that happens in a variety of other circumstances. We have seen this numerous times before. It is plays out of the same playbook. And so a number of constituencies have to decide what is right and what is wrong. And people fundamentally know that these policies are wrong. The question is, how much do you want to stand up to the current occupant of the White House and these policies uh, that are demonizing people, making us look insane ar around the rest of the world, uh, and has confused the American public about what they should be doing or what people should be saying. And as I said, um, at city level, we don't have, mayors don't have time for all this nonsense. Uh, you've got services that need to be provided. People are here uh, and, um, you know, they're trying to do the best they can. Uh, and, but and if you're nowhere near the border, it is very hard to understand what all this is really about. Mayor Nutter, just a quick follow-up, because you know the political scene best of everyone on this panel. And, I'm not sure about that anymore. Um, <laughs> you do, <laughs> and understand Washington better than most of us, I think. Is there, do you have any sense, is there a chance in this idea that you put out that people have to stand up, that Republicans in Washington will actually, at some point, stand up around this issue, particularly around the issue of separation and uh, of immigrant only Only if their constituents uh, demand it. Okay. It's back to Lee's point. Mm -hmm. It was bipartisan opposition. I mean, it, uh, you know, I, regardless of who you are and what your party and your philosophy is, I mean, it might be a little hard for some folks when they went home, uh, you know, that night and they've got children and somebody in the family says, Mom, Dad, what in the hell is going on here? Right. What, you know, what are you doing? I mean, I think that makes it a little uncomfortable when you go back to Congress the next day and you're talking to your colleagues and like, we know, I mean, quietly, they'll say, well, we know this doesn't make any sense. They're fearful uh, of the retribution from a psychotic uh, at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> they need to grow up. Okay, Steve. Yeah. yeah. So about elections and about organizing, I would say two things um, that are actually riffs off what Lee and Mayor Nutter were talking about. First of all, I'm not worried about the congressman who represents this district. I'm not worried about the Jerry Nadlers of the world. I'm not worried about them. They're good. They're on our side. Um, and New York City, I'm not worried about New York City as a whole. Maybe Staten Island sometimes, but most of the time. <laughs> Most of the time, I'm not worried about New York City. But are people ready to actually go to places? And there are a lot of places outside New York City. And are, are they ready to do the work? Are they ready to say, you know what, I'm going to be part of this movement. And that means actually going to places like Long Island. Right? I'm not worried about Jerry Nadler. I'm very worried about Lee Zeldin, mm. the congressman from Long Island who's like a little mini Trump, like a Trump mini me he parrots everything that trump says he talks about ms13 you know i'm worried about him i'm as mayor nutter said he needs to be scared and what can we do here in new york city to make sure that he lee zeldin out of long island is feeling a little scared like laura curran the nassau county executive a democrat you know she decided to take ice and put up an office on the grounds of a public hospital out there. So that people want to go get health care, you gotta walk by the ICE office. What are we doing to make sure that Laura Curran is scared? Right? That's the question. The question is not how do we make sure elections wise. The question is, you know, not 
How do we make sure Jerry Nadler's good on our issues? He's good on our issues. The question is, how do we make sure that all these other places in New York State, I'm not talking about Alabama or Mississippi, I'm talking about Long Island, I'm talking about Westchester and the Hudson Valley, I'm talking about places like that. That's the question. If we want to make sure that things like family separation policy never see the light of day again, then we need to be committed to making sure we do what we can do so that the Lee Zeldins and the John Katkos and people like that feel the heat and that, the, that they understand that their constituents don't do it. You know, one of the things that we're doing right now is around driver's licenses. And that's the second point that I would make. We, people will throw down around family separation. They will do that, right? I'm sure the polling numbers of that are great. The polling numbers around other policies, though, around immigration, this goes back to Lee's point, the, the single biggest thing that New York State can do to keep families together right now is to pass driver's licenses, is to make sure that New York State makes driver's licenses happen. We, folks used to be able to get driver's licenses, and then in the wake of 9-11, there was a huge xenophobic you know, uh, backlash, and basically it became outlawed, right? You need to show a social security number. So overnight, there were hundreds of thousands of undocumented immigrants who could not get a driver's license anymore. And so if you are driving upstate or anywhere for that matter without a license because you have to take your child to the hospital, because you're going to work or because you are you know, going to meet your kids' uh, teachers at school and you get caught driving without a license, you will get put into jail. And then a lot of times that jail will call ICE and then boom, you will be inside the deportation industrial complex. So the one thing that New York State can do to support and keep families together is to do driver's licenses. What's the polling support on that? Not great, right? And then if you actually talk to people and walk them through the process, then the support for that jumps dramatically. But what are we doing to make sure that there is support for immigration that's not an inch deep and a mile wide, right? How do we make sure that people are throwing down and saying, immigration is my issue, not just when it comes to family separation, not just when it comes to Muslim ban, but on a bunch of different immigrant issues? That is the way that we start to actually exact the political price, right? So when Governor Cuomo and these other folks come by, we say, you know what? You're coming to the Upper West Side, but what are you doing around driver's licenses? It's by throwing down around immigration issues that are not just the high-profile ones of the day and also figure out what we can do to organize in places that are less politically amenable to immigrants. That is how we're going to actually make change on the federal level and make sure that things like the family separation policy die a, a you know, die the death that it's supposed to die. Thank you. Um, and finally, uh, Erwin, do you want to elaborate a little bit on uh, your earlier points of what you think um, sure. people should be doing? Well, first of all, just, let me just say something about this, um, this issue of why people are not getting more engaged, even what the challenges are. It's, Maybe I know I'm not the only one who's overwhelmed by the things we need to mm -hmm. throw down on. I mean, it's it's climate change, it's uh, choice, it's it's uh, tax policy, it's it's reversing uh, regula regulations that protect the American people. It's I, I don't remember ever feeling so overwhelmed by issues. Each one of them is crying out for urgency and priority, and I think that's something that activists in a variety of areas need to try to come to grips with. It's just, you don't even know where to turn with. It's impossible to watch the news. Every day is a fire hose of stuff coming at us, which is we keep saying, how many times have you said, I can't believe it, but this is unbelievable in the last two years. I'm, I can't even say the words anymore. I just did, but anyway, I think there are real issues here, not to mention the fact that we're, we're gonna get another round of child separation policies that are coming down. Mm -hmm. In various guises, one of them, uh, the other one is called binary choice, which is that uh, Steve Miller is cooking up this idea where if you're a family, you're given a choice. You either can agree to being separated from your child once they got apprehended, uh, and we will uh, facilitate your asylum hearing, or we'll keep you all in custody interminably. That's a horrendous way of, uh, of really intimidating uh, families to kind of be caught in this 
horrible trap concocted by these folks in the White House. So, the one, I, and I do um, stand correct in terms of the, the numbers. I think that I, that's obviously true what uh, Lee was saying. But in my own defense, what I'll say is that I don't care how many agents there are or how many people are coming across. I can tell you, because I've spoken to many of these agents, they are overwhelmed and they are terrified uh, after those two children died with, in such a, mm -hmm. such a public fury rising that they actually don't know what to do about that. They need, they need something, and it's not going to come from the administration. And I think it behooves all of us to try to at least help make sure that the children's, children who are experiencing health and mental health disorders are recognized, they're identified, and they're getting the help that they need. But coming back to the political thing, I don't know, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that, the, the overwhelming number of issues that are on the table right now. Uh, I, I absolutely agree. There's always an outrage, a new outrage every day. But at a certain point, oh, we, you know, we've got to translate protests into lasting yeah, political movements. And we've got to make choices. It, I, I guarantee you, you know, our ability to get 30,000 people out for a march, you know, I mean, it, it's huge. But we are not going to have the political power to be able to actually make a difference if we don't translate that into a lasting movement. And some of that is on us. That's all, some of that is on a lot of other people, right? Some of that is on all of you. How do we actually say that we're going to commit and we're going to work on a long-term political project in which we are going to throw down for not just one march, but for an extended period of time? That's what the right wing does. That's what they do. They're in, they're in it for the long haul, the haters, right? They're in it for the long haul. We need to similarly be ready to do that same thing and to actually say, you know, you're going to feel the political price and the political heat for not being good on this issue. Uh, uh, I know we're going to go to q and I mean, the, the... Yeah, and Audrey, the, could you collect the questions, yeah. please? I mean, the, the challenge is, it goes back to what uh, the doctor was saying, though, uh, a couple of us have mentioned this. I mean, there is a new thing every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just hard to keep track. And which, uh, you know, I mean, you can't die on every hill, as they say. And so how many battles are you going to fight on a regular basis with these folks? And I think this is all by design. Uh, oh, yeah. I don't, certainly yeah. don't want to give them too much credit for, for being smart. I mean, it just throw whatever out there on a regular basis. And if you're outraged by this today, we got something else for you tomorrow, which will distract you from the thing that you really cared about yesterday, because now you have this new thing over here that's going to drive you crazy. And that is a, a process and a pattern of activity to keep the American public so uh, confused, uh, so distraught, so discompopulated, uh, that you, uh, at times, are just paralyzed. And I, I totally get that, and I totally understand that. But I think if folks can take it upon themselves and say, and, and figure out, and have ways to engage in a way that changes the narrative, because right now the narrative is those folks over there are having these problems, right? Mm -hmm. Even in New York State, it's those people over there, those immigrants there, they want this, right? That's the problem with the driver's license thing is, you know, people say, oh, I don't want to give those people driver's license. Well, it's not about giving anybody anything. But one of the things that's actually been remarkably impactful is, you know, there's this group called the Workman Circle. And it's like a progressive Jewish group. And what they've done is they've organized canvassing efforts in Long Island in the district of State Senator Anna Kaplan. So all of a sudden, she's not just hearing from Latinos and immigrants that driver's licenses needs to happen. All of a sudden, she's also hearing from Jewish constituents in her district. That has real impact. You know, earlier this morning, for example, I, I read that, you know, we, we have 30 votes, and we're trying to get to 32. You, 32 is the magic number to make driver's licenses happen. We have 30 votes in the Senate. Anna Kaplan, I guarantee you, is not one of them. Hmm. So by participating and, and joining a canvassing effort where you get you know, hundreds of postcards, it's not an overwhelming number, in a district in Long Island where folks are going and talking to communities um, that they're familiar with, that, that little, that's one way to have a lasting political impact. And I think that's one example. So totally get it, there's a fire hose of, of trauma and outrage that happens on a daily basis, but there are ways to actually engage in a way that changes the narrative. Yeah. So it's not just those people over there want this, mm -hmm. but it's, 
hey, this is something that affects, you know, that affects me, and I believe in, and I'm going to throw down around this. I agree. Can I throw out uh, one more question here? Because I think, you know, this changing the narrative and changing the way uh, people are thinking about uh, what issues are important to them when they vote seems critically uh, the way we need to go here. But I'm struck right now we have a, just take the new crop of Congress folks in Washington coming from what was considered a, um, you know, a left wing grassroots um, movement. I don't see immigration and this issue, particularly immigrant children, uh, at the top of the list of what anybody's talking about. I saw the Green New Deal. I saw, you know, I don't, I, I follow all the presidential candidates and it struck me as we're talking here, one thing we know, people have opinions, but those are not necessarily the opinions that inform their vote. That there is only a couple of issues that can translate into who they're gonna vote for and where the pressure's <coughs> gonna come from. So what's wrong here? What, do, what needs to be done to move this up the scale, both at the elite level and at the grassroots level because I was seeing this like you as primarily a grassroots problem pushing that way, but now as, as I'm thinking and listening, I see this also as an elite problem at, and on the left as well where you would think this would be a top priority and I see it receding as a priority. Yeah, well I, I do want to note that the House of Representatives did introduce a bill, H.R. 6, that's that's actually supposed to address the situation of DACA recipients, the DREAMers, and temporary protected status, uh, folks with TPS status. And um, the two legislative sponsors of that are, two of the three are actually New Yorkers. It's Nadia Velasquez and Yvette Clark. And Nancy Pelosi actually came for an event where we announced this just a couple weeks ago. So I don't want to make it seem like the House hasn't you know, taken that action. That is the old guard. That is not one young new. That that, that, that is the old guard. That, that absolutely uh, is the old guard. In that crowd. I here, mean, old it, and good. Don't get me wrong here. But, I'm like part of that old guard. I think. Here's the thing, though. I, I think people think of health care as an issue that they will translate and they will turn out for, mm. right? They think of you know um, that's clearly identified. And I'll be honest with you. I think people on the left, and I think Democrats see immigration as not one of those issues, right? And so that's the challenge that we face. Yeah. We need to demonstrate, and that's what I've been saying, we need to demonstrate that if you don't vote the right one away on immigration, that is actually something that's gonna drive turnout and we are gonna hold our votes on. And I don't think it's there yet. I think that's a reality. And we've got to figure out a way to get it there in the midst of all these other issues that arise. Yeah. Well, I think that on that note, at least we've got uh, a, one significant question from uh, a member of the audience and a couple more coming. So we'll do these questions together and uh, that will wrap us up for the evening. Um, this question is for Lee. In 2015, the greatest number of immigrants were Asians, 12 plus million, as, as this person states, which mm -hmm. I can't verify. Um, are there differences between the Latin experience and the Asian experience mm. in separation? Um, in the family separation, I think there are because the family separation was occurring at the U.S.-Mexican border and the Southwest. And so overwhelmingly it was Latino immigrants from the Northern Triangle. We weren't seeing separations at airports or in the interior. Now there were certainly some people who were not from the Northern Triangle who entered through um, so the Southern border um, you know, as I said, the lead plaintiff in the case was a Congolese mother who made her way all the way there. But yeah, it was overwhelmingly Latino immigrants. So uh, I've been holding this, but I mean, let's be frank. If 
people who are not of color and their children were being separated, coming from Canada, Norway, France, Germany, Europe, or a variety of other places, people would be up on the roof. Mm -hmm. Right. There's no way in the world that if uh, Custom and Border Patrol was separating white children from their families, that the American public would ever put up with this kind of nonsense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it would not go away until the process was fully reversed. You had the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security at a federal, at a congressional hearing, ultimately have to admit, this is the one who just, I guess, was forced to resign, that they had no idea how many children they had, and then got into a debate three weeks ago with a member of Congress about what's a cage. Right. I mean, come on. There's just no way in the world that people would put up with this kind of nonsense, but for the fact that it's those people from those countries, uh, that half of the public may not even know actually where they are, uh, and that they are, you know, of Latin origin. Right. At, at the end of the day, I think the whole history of immigration is about race. You know, I think there's mm -hmm. probably no way to to separate race and immigration. I mean, were kids getting separated at Ellis Island? Um, yes, that's a, actually. That's a good question. I don't know in the but, same way, but, but I think but families... But related to um, illness and right. right, right, right. We have like three last questions here. I'm going to put out these three questions and then we'll begin with Erwin and, and uh, with Lee. So just comment on any aspects of these three questions, uh, all of which I think are important and interesting questions. Uh, there seems to be a struggle breaking large issues down to actionable items for, quote, normal people. <laughs> I guess we're not normal people. Um, up here. How do we better bridge that gap to get people to take action is the first question. What is being done about identifying and connecting separated families, which is also an important question. And finally, the courts have been an important arm for pushing back on the worst components of family separation and other immigrant policies. Should we be worried, given the massive number of appointments that are being uh, rushed through the Senate, yes. that the courts will change? So we have three significant uh, questions here from you, you and I'm going to start with Dr. Redliner, and we'll work our way down. And just take any aspects of these questions. This idea about making fundamental changes in how our country operates on some levels, very, very daunting. You know, we had slavery, we had Jim Crow, we have institutional racism, and it's not going away. And we have many, many African-American children, for example, who have been deprived of normalcy and the ability to attain the future that we expect for every American. And that is something that's going to have to, it just has to change. It's been incredible. Like I said, I've been talking about this for, for 48 years now. But that said, I think my sense of the only hope here, and probably nobody's going to agree with me, is that we need a stealth candidate for the President of the United States that will take this on, much like uh, Lyndon Johnson did. Nobody had any idea of how far he was going to go in the Civil Rights Movement. He probably wouldn't have gotten elected if they did know. Same thing was more or less true with FDR. But I'll tell you, we're going to need some very charismatic Democrat or Republican candidate who's going to get into office in the usual way and turn around and say, I'm going to lead America out of this horrendous morass of the anti-science movement that's going crazy, uh, dealing with, immigra with the immigration challenges, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. I don't actually see how it's going to happen otherwise, frankly. And that's due to the fact that as a lovely, you know, middle class, progressive family, we cannot figure out what the hell to do next. Which issue are we going to grapple with? And as, you know, I've been my heart and soul in this immigration issue, but I also deal with children who are suffering extraordinarily across the country. Mm -hmm. Racist-based. It's just, it's maddening to me. And the same with climate change. Right. It's not going to matter what we do with these other issues if we end up 
really destroying our planet. So if somebody's got a good way of prioritizing this, I'd like to know about it. Short of that, I think we need, like I said, a charismatic uh, new set of leaders who are going to get up there and say, okay, thanks for electing me. Here's what my agenda is. Because that's what Trump did from the absolute opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Steve. You know, I'd actually like to punt on that. I'm, I'm curious to hear what Leah has to say in terms of that specific question about the courts and how that's changing, because I, I see it happening, and I'm, it really gives me pause and, and worry about how our legal system is going to work. Okay. Do you want to pick up on that, and we'll end with me, Renata. Yeah, I mean, so on the, the court question, I think um, it's a very good question. I mean, everyone focuses on the Supreme Court, and understandably so. And I think it's going to become harder for us to win civil rights cases in the Supreme Court. Um, but the lower courts are also becoming a concern. There are a lot of appointments being made in the lower courts. And I think we, that may be really where the action ultimately is, because only so many cases can get to the Supreme Court. And most civil rights cases are in the lower courts and will never get to the Supreme Court. So how many appointments this administration makes is going to be a significant issue. The, the other question I just wanted to say two seconds about it yeah. is the question about how do we make things actionable for people. I think that's an extremely important question and point. And I think that's one place where the ACLU um, got caught off guard, both with the travel ban but also then with family separation even more so. I have gotten so many unsolicited letters and calls saying, what can I do? It can be from someone who just says, I want to help, I don't have any particular special skills, to a social worker, to anybody. Um, and I don't think we were set up to handle that. I don't, it takes a lot of resources even to deal with that intake. And so figuring out what people can do is very, very important. I do, you know, I would, I always say, be out there at the rally, speak out, but people want additional stuff to do besides just writing a check to an NGO. Um, there are places to go to volunteer. You don't have to be a lawyer to, to help someone in an asylum case. There are children to tutor. There's certainly places for doctors to help, but I think we need to do a better job. Um, and I think, you know, Stevens organization does an unbelievable job of sort of giving places, people places to go. But I think we all, the NGOs, if there is going to be this outcry, then need to be able to say to someone, okay, here's what you do. You go to this place and you can help this child or this child needs a backpack. And so would you be interested in, or this parent needs help doing this or that. Um, so that that's an extremely good question. And I think that's one of the other challenges for us is how to actually give people something concrete to do. Um, and I'm, you know, I want people to reach out to us and I, I don't, don't want to go into more detail about all the things we can do, but certainly someone should feel free to reach out to me um, at the ACLU. And you can write a check too. You can write a check. <laughs> Lee and the ACLU but, might need that, it, but we definitely yeah, need that. Yeah, that, that goes without check. saying. No, um, it needs to be said. I know. Yeah. I just need my development officer here to say it. <laughs> there there right. you go. May you not uh, Sure. Um, make it quick. Uh, there was a component within the merged question um, uh, which just caused me to think, you know, we just need, uh, certainly we need the candidates uh, to tell the truth. We need the public to be ready to hear it. I uh, want people to get facts. Uh, and information, wherever, whatever your source is, but just let it be factual um, and make your own decisions. Um, new technologies and the, you know social media and all that, and I'm you know all for you know being um, folks being online. Um, but what I really want folks to do is to be in line. Mm -hmm. I want you to be in a line on election day. No matter how long that line is, no matter how long it takes, because when all is said and done, elections have consequences. We're, we're dealing with the results of that. If you don't show up, it really doesn't make a difference. And uh, I agree with the doctor that um, it'd be great to have somebody with charisma, uh, but what I'm also really looking for is somebody with character. Mm -hmm. 
somebody with conviction and a person that's competent and understands what it takes to actually run a government and get stuff done and make things happen. Elections have consequences. We're experiencing it now. If you don't like what's going on, show up. Thank Esther, you so Esther, much. I really appreciate everybody coming tonight and a special thank you to this amazing panel. I, I really feel like not only was this informative about a very difficult issue that, that we're facing, but I, I really feel strongly that there's much that we can all do, and I think the direction that the panelists have told us to take uh, really provides something for everyone in this room and everyone that everyone in this room knows. And I'd like to call on our Mayor Dinkins now to close us out, as he always does every year, and to say good night. I thought I would just project. <laughs> but I'm pleased to see so many of you here. And uh, I almost want to go around the room and call names. Hi, Skip. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's good that you're here because uh, of those persons who are concerned with the issues here discussed, I think you can be multiplied many times. They're just not here at this moment, but they're caring as you are. And I think it's so important, and I hope you will help spread the word about uh, that which needs to be done, and that there are people who are doing things, like uh, my friends here. So it's so important. So thank you all so much for coming. Good night, and God bless you all.